So today I'm super excited to introduce my friend Peter De Silva, who came all the way from Boston uh, via Kansas City to join us today. So the reason I wanted to bring Peter to town is because he was the leader of the Kansas City Chamber of Commerce's what they call Big Five Initiative. We're going to talk a little bit about this. But it was essentially a goal to make Kansas City America's most entrepreneurial city. And if you ask those people in Kansas City, they would have laughed. Like, we're not entrepreneurial. We don't have startup companies. Why? We're definitely not the most. We don't have any data to back this up. But in some sense, it didn't matter because Kansas City wanted to put their flag in the ground and say that this is who they wanted to be and set a vision and be aspirational in that declaration. Uh, but also, Peter wrote a book. And so he has shared his expertise on uh, leadership in the financial industry. Um, he's worked in several different uh, banks and financial institutions. Uh, I worked with him when he was at UMB Bank in Kansas City and was the COO there. Uh, and uh, also very community active and did a bunch of different things. Oh, yeah. Um, and then I'm reading Peter's book and I read about this debilitating disease that Peter was born with and uh, affects a lot of members of his family. And I had no idea. Uh, so A, I think he just hit it really well. B, he just overcame it. But now he has uh, set out on a quest to not only raise awareness about this disease that affects a lot more people than I certainly realized in the United States and around the world, but also is on a campaign to raise uh, $10 million, is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. To try to uh, find a cure, of course, ultimately, but also find a treatment. There are no current treatments for this disease. So uh, I'll let him tell you way more about the specifics of that. Uh, but uh, Peter has just had a, a fantastic uh, uh, life, and he's going to share that with us today. He's got some slides he's going to share with us. And uh, if you didn't get a copy of the book, uh, we do have just a few more left. And I know he'd love to sign them for you after, uh, after he talks. So please give a nice forward and global entrepreneurship <laughs> week welcome <laughs> to Peter De Silva. Uh, thanks, pal. Do me a favor. Yeah. Can you get the air mouse over there? Uh, oh. I'm going to have to get used to being tethered. I, uh, I left the air mouse over there so I could advance the slides. And if I tried to go get it, I'd probably die. So <laughs> thank you, Cameron, and thank you, everybody. It is so wonderful to be here in Fort Worth. This is not a place I haven't been before. I've been here many times before. Uh, when I did live in Kansas City and um, UMB Bank, we started a, a business in Dallas and we moved over here to Fort Worth. So I love your community. I love the energy about your community. I don't love the weather today, but it's better than Boston, trust me. So I am really thrilled to be here. And so why did I come down here? Other than Cameron asking, and when Cameron asked me, I was, I was delighted to do it. Uh, principally because, you know, this issue of entrepreneurship, this issue of economic development, this issue of how free enterprise operates in our country is one of the most important things I think that we as a nation have to understand and appreciate about, about our country. There's a lot of wonderful things about the United States of America, but what distinguishes it, I believe, more than anything else is the idea that free enterprise really can be, can be practiced here, right? And you could, we could argue for an hour about the definition of free enterprise, but we do have a rule of law and we do have governments that you can trust, and we do have you know, many, many, many different dimensions of that that you can, that you can count on. Uh, contrast that with China, right? Our, friends, uh, our friend President Xi yesterday met with all these business leaders out in San Francisco, and he said, China's open for business, China's wonderful. Well, where's the rule of law? And, and are they gonna throw me in jail if I say or do the wrong thing? So great, they're on a journey, and maybe they'll get closer to our model over time, but this is the model that has proven to work to create the most economic, uh, economic vitality and, and wealth creation. And by the way, there's no other system in the history of the world that has lifted more people out of poverty. Period. Plain and simple. End stop. You won't find it. It's imperfect. It does create differences, imbalances for sure. You can have an Elon Musk and you can have individuals who don't know where their next meal is coming from. So I get that it creates imbalances but it has lifted more people out of poverty than any system known to man. So we're going to get back into that discussion a little bit towards the end. And if you want to ask questions about it, I'm certainly more than happy to, uh, to respond to that. Oh, no, I didn't turn it on. Why would I do that? That was my job. Because you told me to turn it on. I didn't do it. Kendall, she came through. But here's what I'd like to talk just a little bit about for the next 30 to 40 minutes or so. Just like you ought to get to know me a little bit. So just a little bit about my journey and how I ended up where I ended up and uh, for good or for bad. A little bit about 
two things that are really important for all of you to think about, which is this notion of taking risks in your life and in your career, and when to take them and how to take them. And the most important thing, if I, if I leave you with any thought, it's really about building relationships and the durability and the importance of building those relationships, not in the moment necessarily, but down the road. And my whole life has been a, a um, relationship, if you will, opportunity where things have happened to me and for me because of relationships I built in the past. And we'll talk through the book a bit. And then I do want to spend some time thinking about the big five, which was this economic development strategy that we built in uh, Kansas City when I was chairman of the Chamber of Commerce and how that has endured even today. And the big five is still the big five in Kansas City, although they've rotated stuff in and out as we've completed certain things and, and uh, started, new, started new things. And then I'm happy to take your questions anywhere along the way. So anybody know what an Azorian is? Not a single person in the room <laughs> has ever heard of the Azores Islands. Well, now you have. That's the good news. There are nine little islands off the coast of Portugal uh, called the Azores. By the way, they're the most beautiful place in the world. They are um, called the Hawaii of the Atlantic for a reason. And tourism has taken off in the last decade. I can't tell you how many people are like, oh, I'm going to the Azores, I'm going to the Azores. They're like, oh, you've heard of them, that's cool. Um, so I'm Azorian, which kind of makes me unique in that respect. There's not many of us in the country. My grandparents came to the United States seeking a better life, just like most of our family, uh, families did for sure. Um, and when it came time to go to college, my parents said, you have three choices. You can go to the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth, you can go to UMass Dartmouth, or you can go to UMass Dartmouth. <laughs> and you have to stay at home, because we can't afford to send you, and you have to get a full-time job to put yourself through school. I'm like, I can do that, I get it. I was just thrilled that there was an opportunity for me to actually participate in higher education. You know, as a young man, I thought that maybe being a fireman or a policeman or something would be my highest and best calling. And then I found school, I, I found the university, and I decided, no, I think I can, I can do, do, do different things beyond, beyond that. And so I started taking risks, all right? So I graduated from UMass, and then I'll never forget the day I went home and said to my family that I was moving to Boston to take a job for, well, with Fidelity Investments. And that was about an hour away from where I grew up. And they thought I had lost my mind. Like, well, why, would you, why would you do that? What's wrong with living here? And I'm like, well, I just don't think the opportunities are as bold and as big as I'd like them to be sitting here. And so they said, okay, go ahead. They, we've lost him. He's never coming back. And I decided that, you know, I, did, I wanted that for myself. And so I took my big first risk, first big risk, went to Boston and worked for Fidelity Investments. Now, just a little side story because it's a kind of a cute story. So when I interviewed uh, at Fidelity, I interviewed with 20 people, 25 people. And I was going into their advanced leadership training program, and so I interviewed with lots of folks. And there was this one person I interviewed with, and I didn't give it, I didn't give it a second thought. Um, I didn't think she liked me and I didn't think I liked her, to be honest. But anyways, as time went on, we got to know each other and whatever issues she had with me began to fade and whatever issues I had with her began to fade as well. And we ended up getting married. Wow. So I met my wife on a job interview and people assume wrongly that somehow I was interviewing her. And that's not right, she was interviewing me. And the funny part of that job, the uh, funny part of that is she turned me down for the job, swear to God. I met 20 people and 19 thought I was pretty decent and one thought I was an idiot. <laughs> guess who? But uh, we met 33 years later, we're still together, so I guess I'm not that bad. Um, let's see, I spent 35 years in financial services, all right? That became the core of my professional career. Companies like Fidelity Investments for 17 years, UMB Financial Corp for 12, Scott Trade for a couple, uh, and then TD Ameritrade for some, some period of time. And the book is really a compendium of, of those experiences, those 35 years of life and leadership and business experiences that I thought were worthy of imparting to, to all of you and to, and to other folks as, as well. So the last part of my journey was, I was the president over at TD Ameritrade and we sold that company to Charles Schwab. And Schwab said what they should say, which is you can go away, you know, here's some stock or whatever, but go away. And we don't want to see you for two years in the industry. So I had a non-compete. So here I am sitting at home like, okay, I've got a two-year non-compete. 
I'm locked out of the industry that I've been part of for a long, long, long time. Most of my network, most of my contacts are in that industry. What am I going to do? And so I ended up at Harvard. Um, they have this amazing program called the Advanced Leadership uh, Initiative for folks like me, transitioning, if you will, out of one thing maybe to another. And I spent 18 months, uh, 18 months doing that. And during that time, I wouldn't call it free time, but I made some time to write Taking Stock. And I really felt like, you know what, I think there's some messages I'd like to impart, and they're contained in the, in the book that you, just, that you just received. So that's a little bit about my, my background. So these two ideas of taking risks and building relationships, this is a little bit of the journey that I went on uh, locationally over the last, the last 30 years or so. So I, I grew up in the Boston area and Dartmouth, Massachusetts, and you know, I ended up in Boston as I described. I ended up in Cincinnati for two years. I moved back to Boston after my time in Cincinnati. I went to Kansas City for 12. I went to St. Louis for five and I've recently done a return trip back, back to the Boston area. Here's what's important about that. It's not the fact that I did it. Lots of people do that. Lots of people move around and, and do what, they, do what they, uh, they wanna do. But what was important about it is at every stop, at every stop, I can tell you this, I grew faster. I definitely grew more, more rapidly, I guess I'll just leave it at that, than I otherwise would have if I had stayed still. And I remember my boss telling me, my boss at Fidelity, telling me, he's like, you, you need to go to Cincinnati. I said, Fred, I'm not, going, I'm not going to Cincinnati. Let me be clear about that. I'm from Boston. I grew up in Boston. I'm not going to Cincinnati. He said, well, I think you should. I said, I'm not going. So a few weeks, a few weeks later, he walks in my office and he says, uh, I told you to go to Cincinnati. Why aren't you there? I said, Fred, I told you I'm not doing it. And he said, that's a career limiting move for you to make to make that statement. I said, what are you saying? And he's like, well, he said it in a um, very direct way. He said, son, your desk has moved to Cincinnati. Are you going or not? That was the answer. I mean, it, there was no debate. I said, I, I got it. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. But it was the best decision I ever made. So I get there and without going to all the gory details, some of which are in the book, it was a difficult situation. We were, we were having significant issues in this, in this site. And the weirdest thing started to happen. So I started making decisions. I started growing. I started changing the organization. I tried to create a culture. I tried to create a new vision and strategy for the teams and such. And I think we were having, I know we were having some success. But Fred, my boss from Boston, would come down every week. Every week he'd come down. He'd sit in his office, he'd read the newspaper, he'd make a few phone calls, he'd get on a plane and go back home. I was like, what the heck? I want that job. That's, I'm working my head off trying to figure out how to fix this thing and he's sitting there reading the newspaper all day. One time, one time his admin calls me and he says, she says, have you seen Fred today? I said, I, I haven't seen him. I don't know where the heck he is. She's like, nobody can find him. I said, well, maybe he's dead in a ditch or something. I don't know where he is. So, I don't know, at 2 o'clock he comes wandering in the office and I'm like, hey, they're all looking for you back in Boston. We thought maybe you got killed or something. He said, no, he said, I, I have this goal in life to run in all 50 states. And if you know anything about the geography of Cincinnati, you can be in Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio in about two minutes. <laughs> so it's like I decided to run in three states today so I could put a pin in the, in the map at home. <laughs> this went on and on and on for the two years I was there. So one night after I had moved back to Boston, um, I'm at a cocktail party and Fred's boss, Mark, says to me, geez, Peter, you know, we really appreciate you going out there. You really did a wonderful job. You cleaned up the mess we had created for ourselves, whatever. And he says, quote, and to think none of us on the executive committee thought you could do it. So I'm like, what? It's the first time I'm hearing this, right? And so the next morning I, go into Fred's office and now I close the door and I said, what the heck just happened last night between Mark and I? And he's like, oh, it's no big problem, no big deal. I'm like, what do you mean it's no big deal? It's a huge deal to me. What the heck happened? And he said, look, he said, you were young. You were the youngest senior vice president of the company's history. You were young. You were brash. I thought you could do the job. In fact, I knew you could do the job. And I stopped the mid-sentence mid and I said, I get it. 
you came out there every week not because you knew I needed help, but you wanted to inspire confidence in them that this young guy was out there fixing this very complex set of problems and you just wanted to support me. And he put his head down and he's like, yeah, you got me. It's one of the best leadership lessons I've ever taken, which is you basically can take risks on people. You must take risks on people. But as I describe in the book, I believe you need to build a fence around those people. Because I fundamentally believe that if you're an entrepreneur, failure can be a badge of honor, quite honestly. Right? You go to Silicon Valley, these guys have failed eight times and they finally hit it. But they keep getting money. I can't believe, sorry to get off track. I can't believe that somebody's funding Adam Newman again, who created WeWork. <laughs> it's like, what are you kidding me? But people are throwing money at the guy. Right? Anyways, so it was one of the great lessons that you need to take risks on people. You need to take risks on yourself, build fences around them so that they don't fail or that you do as much as you can such that they don't fail. And in a corporate context, I don't care how, the, how often they say we're okay with failure, they're really not. <laughs> Entrepreneurs, yeah, I get it. People understand these are highly risky ventures. I get it. In a corporate context, they're really not okay with failure to be honest with you. So build that fence, give young people an opportunity to spread their wings and grow, but protect them along the way. So anyways, I could go on and on, but I, I did do a lot of moving around the country, uh, which benefited me at every single turn. And that's really the message there. So I'm gonna just spend a moment talking about some of the key themes in the book, in Taking Stock. And the first one is this idea of the awesome power of your personal mosaic. So anybody, everybody knows what a mosaic is, right? Or a stained glass window, you could use the same uh, comparison if you want. In essence, it takes every little piece in order to create the image. Anybody been to the Blue Mosque in Istanbul? It's unbelievable. But it's all little pieces of tile, like tens of millions of pieces that when put together display a beautiful image. Well, I believe that your life is basically a mosaic. Your life is made up of all these little pieces and parts that are put together in this picture. Call it a mosaic, call it a stained glass window, whatever you want to call it. And that every experience you have, that every person you meet along the way is on that mosaic. You can't take them off. Once we've met each other now, you can't un undo the fact that we've met each other. I'm on your mosaic for good or for bad. And good things and bad things end up on mosaics, by the way. I've worked for a lot of people in my life where I look at them and I'm like, wow, I want to I role model that. If I'm ever in that situation, I am absolutely going to do it exactly the way he or she just, just did it. There's an equal number of people on my mosaic where I'm like, I will never do it the way they did it. So both things can be on your mosaic and that's okay. Everybody's done a jigsaw puzzle, right? How frustrating is it when one piece is missing at the end or two pieces are missing at the end? It's not complete. Well, your mosaic's not complete either until one thing happens. In essence, when you draw your last breath, because everything up until then is building, building this picture. And when you're gone, you leave that picture for your family. And it's the greatest gift you ever give them, which is this idea of all these interactions and all these experiences you've had being put on that mosaic. So I talk more about that in the book, but it's a very, I find it to be a very powerful construct and, and others have suggested that to me as well. Using vulnerability as a leadership strength. Cameron referenced, I have this disease called Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. It's a terrible thing, I hate it. Um, it'll put me in a wheelchair at some point. My sister's in a wheelchair, my daughter has it. Uh, my brothers and sisters have various forms of it. So it's, it's not a, a, a great thing. When I grew up, my parents told me the only way to deal with that is to keep it quiet, to not disclose it, and just to not ever, ever, ever talk about it. It's your problem. It's now nobody else's problem. And I lived that for 58 years, basically. I just decided she was right, my mom was right. Keep it quiet, it's nobody else's problem. And you shoulder through it, whatever. There's a lot of pain that goes with this thing, you just deal with it. But then you start to see people really hurting. And you see your daughter, who is a national sailing champion, 
maybe have to give that up because she doesn't have the strength to do it anymore and such. And you begin to realize that if you have a, even the smallest chance to positively influence that, you're going to want to do it. So I decided it was time to come clean and talk about this disease. And I talk about it in the book again. Um, and I began to understand that while you don't want to be vulnerable every minute of every day, <laughs> that's not a positive thing. There are moments for vulnerability. And candidly, what I've learned over time is people want to work with leaders who are authentic, who are genuine, who are transparent. And quite honestly, if you're hiding something that important, you're probably not those three things. Even though you believe you are, you're probably not fully transparent, right? 30 years ago when I was growing up in business, you would never want to show a vulnerability. It was all about strength and character and it, you would never show vulnerability. Today, I think employers and people more generally are, are more accepting of people with, with differences and such. So anyways, I learned how to use that vulnerability as a, as a leadership strength. I spent a lot of time in the community driving, I hope, positive change. Leading the Big Five was one of the things we'll talk about in a minute. But I spent a lot of time doing it. And I've come to not only believe, well, I, I've come to see and I now believe that business is the greatest uh, catalyst for positive social change of anything, anything out there. It's not government. It's not not-for-profits. Nothing wrong with not-for-profits. Nothing wrong with government to a point. Um, it is business as the catalyst for social change. 160 million people in the United States work in businesses. What happens inside those four walls, how we treat each other, the kind of values that we have, the kinds of experiences that we have, will say more about America, more about social change, positive social change, than any program the government will put together or any individual not-for-profit can actually impact. Because you can do it at scale. Like I said, 160 million people work in businesses of one kind or another. So I just have found that business is the catalyst for change, uh, largely. Doesn't mean government can't be helpful. It doesn't mean that not-for-profits aren't useful. Don't get me wrong. But ultimately, if you want change, you do it through the business context. Overcoming adversity is something I've lived with. And um, yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that. And then I offer for your consideration these 10 life and leadership principles uh, in the book. And we're going to go through just a couple today. I don't have time to go through all three, but I'll take you through just a couple and how I arrived at my, my, ten, my 10 principles. Book's done incredibly well. I, I've been very gratified by the response. It's just won another award yesterday. It's not even up there. Um, so it's been winning awards. It's been, it's been uh, well received in the, in the marketplace overall. And I must admit, it's a bit of a surprise. I didn't write the book to sell books. I know that sounds weird. I really didn't. I wrote it to really get some ideas on a piece of paper, offer those to, to you and others to contemplate. The fact that I've sold a few books is actually a, a plus and a benefit, but that's not, not really, really why I did it. So I've been very gratified. I'm most gratified when somebody emails me, calls me, writes me, or stops me in the hall and says, your book touched me in a certain way. I can relate to that situation. If I'm in that situation in the future, I'm never going to do it the way I used to do it. Those things really make me feel really good. And I've had a number of those, a number of those uh, occasions. So it's been great. All right. So the book does offer these 10 life and leadership principles. And they're not like, you know, oh, I never thought of that before. But when you look at them individually and you uh, align them with the experiences I've had, and then ultimately um, you think about them in the context of the 10 taking together, I think they're quite powerful. And so let's start with the first one. Again, I'm only going to do two or three. Uh, creating this idea of a, a compelling uh, vision. So I was telling this story last night, but I think it's, I think it's illustrative of, of, of this. So there's a guy walking down the street, and he sees a gentleman laying, laying bricks, just laying bricks in the, on, the, on the side. And he says, what are you doing? And the gentleman says, I'm, I'm laying bricks. I'm like, oh, okay, terrific. So he walks a little further, and he sees another gentleman laying bricks. And he says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building a wall. I'm, each brick is building a wall. OK, great. So I go a little further and um, ask the next gentleman, what are you doing? He's laying bricks. And he says, I'm building a cathedral. So which one had the vision? Which one really understood how their action, laying a brick, was contributing to the big picture, which was creating a cathedral? Only one of the three had that vision. 
Now put that into a business context or any context, I suppose. Um, the question I would ask all of you as leaders is are you helping to one set, two communicate, and three enroll people in the vision that you might have for your organization, for your team, for your family, right? I do a lot of work with very wealthy families as a trustee. You'd be shocked how many families don't have any, well, very wealthy families, don't have like a family mission statement, a family vision. They don't have anything. They're just going through the motions every day, right? So I always encourage them, what's the mission of this family? And how the heck are you going to be, how do you want to be remembered when it's all done? So this idea of communicating a compelling vision and purpose is so important. Um, today's young people in particular want to work for companies that have a purpose, a purpose beyond profit, right? There's a course at Harvard called Purpose and Profit that I had a chance to, to, to sit, in, sit in on. And it was, very, it was very useful. It was a useful conversation about what is the purpose and what is profit. And profit, by the way, is part of the purpose, for sure. You can't have a business that sustains itself without profit, so you have to have it. But how do you reinvest that back into the core purpose and mission of the organization? I'm telling you, young people will make a decision on where to work, yeah, on compensation, and yeah, on location, and yeah, on whether I can work from home, but purpose matters an awful, an awful lot. So be thinking about this, if you haven't sort of sat back and really thought about, do we have a compelling vision and purpose, do it, it's important. Um, so let's look at this one, take care of your associates. So I have a saying uh, that goes like this, if you take care of associates, they'll take care of clients and the rest will take care of itself. Many companies, I'd argue most companies, don't share that perspective. They talk about client centricity. There's nothing wrong with being client centric, don't get me wrong. But I'll argue you can't be client centric if you're not associate centric first. If you don't have a workforce that's raving, a raving fan of the company, they're not going to show it. They're not going to display it when they're in front of clients. When I was at the bank, every year we uh, had an annual report. We were a public company, so we put out an annual report. Lots of charts, lots of figures, lots of everything in there. But there was only one chart that I really cared about. And that chart had three elements to it. It had what was our associate engagement, what was our client engagement, client satisfaction, and what were our overall operating results financially. Well, guess what? Over the course of a decade, there was a very tight positive correlation between the health of the associate base, the satisfaction of the client base, and the ultimate results we were able to put up. It's true. I think if you can only pick one, associates or clients, pick associates and trust them to take care of clients. There are organizations that do that, not all. Southwest Airlines, when Herb Kelleher ran it, he talked about that. He's like, it's, it's about the people. It's about creating a culture and an environment that's delivered by human beings. And by the way, with all this talk of AI and all this talk of removing people from the equation, I think it's very dangerous in terms of how you actually build commitment, how you build culture. Now, you all probably want to work from home. I don't love it, just to be candid. Transactionally, it's fine. We can get stuff done. Relationally, I don't think so. Culture, I don't think so. So use it transactionally, that's fine. But just to say, I'm, I'm never going to go back in the office again, I think that's super, super, super risky. So think about associates first. I know it's an easy thing to say, but put them at the center of your thinking. They'll put the clients at the center of, of their thinking. I've already talked a little bit about mutually beneficial relationships. Spend your life building relationships. Trust me. They will pay dividends for many, many, many years to come. And the only other one I'll talk maybe about is leading by principles and not rules. This is also very, very true for younger people today, right? So what's the difference between a principle and a rule? So let's think about the Code of Hammurabi. Everybody know what that is, right? It's a relic of history. It was very rules-based. If you do this, you will be killed. If you do that, the stones are going to start to fly. And ultimately, it didn't, it didn't work. It had cause and effect. If you do this, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do that. But it didn't work. Contrast that with the Declaration of Independence, which is a very principled document. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. It doesn't then go on for 75,000 pages like the IRS code 
to enumerate what me, being equal means. Being equal means being equal. Now, we haven't always lived that out, but that's what it means. It's a principle. And so I encourage you to think about as you structure your organizations, as you think about how you're going to function, think about being principle based and letting people operate within those principles. Yes, there have to be guardrails. Absolutely. And yes, there has to be monitoring mechanisms. So, you know, if you're getting off the rail or somebody's getting off the reservation, you have to have all those things. Trust me, people want to work in a principled organization, not a rules based organization. When I joined the bank, candidly, no disrespect, the Kemper family had run it for 100 years and they had certain things that they did and there were behaviors that were completely unacceptable to me. Yelling at people, calling people out in public, whatever it might be. We shut that down. It's like, no, no, we're going to one, treat people the right way, but two, we're going to operate in a very principled way. And it made a huge difference in the satisfaction and engagement of our, of our workforce. So I won't go, well, don't have time today to go through the rest of these. They're all enumerated in the book, and I go into quite a bit of depth uh, on each of these and encourage you to look at them at your, at your convenience. So I've been uh, in a leadership capacity for whatever, 35, 40 years uh, at this juncture. And I often think about what is the right definition? Is there a universal definition of leadership? There are thousands of definitions. There are thousands of leadership books in the world, right? There are a dime a dozen. Mine's, mine's now a dime a dozen. Maybe mine's a nickel. I don't know. But it's, it's just, it's add to the long list of leadership books out there. So I've been thinking about, you know, okay, here's some definitions. These are all fine. These are all fine definitions, but candidly, none of these and the other hundreds that I've read really resonated with me. So I don't mind saying I'm a Christian and I'm a religious person, and so I look to the Bible for inspiration. And so I started thinking about this one day. I said, well, at my wedding, of course, we read this 1 Corinthians chapter, and many people read it at Christian weddings. I think it's a wonderful, a wonderful statement of, of, of fact. Um, but interestingly, when this was written, it actually wasn't written about, about love, even though it talks about love. It was written about love in a very ethereal sort of, sort of context at the time. But you can read it. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful, or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never ends. Everybody seen that before? Probably. Somewhere along the way. So I got to thinking one day, um, what if I change the word love to the word leadership? How would that read? And would that at least resonate with me? It doesn't have to resonate with you. So I did it. I'll give you a chance to sort of read that and internalize that for just a second. So in the book, I spend quite a bit of time dissecting this and, and talking about this passage in a leadership context, not just the context of, of love. And for me, it's the best definition I've ever seen. It's the best, it's actually a bit imperfect, and I can point that out as well. But it's the best holistic definition I've ever, I've ever seen. How can you be a leader and not be kind? How can you be a leader and not be patient? And pay it forward, and coach people, and mentor people, and try to create the next generation of leaders? How can you be a leader and be arrogant or boastful or rude? I've seen this, I've seen this movie before, and some of them are leaders and some of them are pretty successful people, don't get me wrong, but they diminish themselves, at least in my eyes, because there's the what and there's the how in life. There's what you accomplish, which is important, but how you accomplish it, I would argue, is much more important, at least to me. Leadership is not irritable or resentful. We all have bad days. <laughs> there's no question about it. I've had many a bad day. But there's no benefit in being irritable about it. Move on. Go on to the next thing. Um, leadership does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. One of the things I, I believe is, I always say to the folks who work for me, facts and data win the day with me, not emotion. Show me the incontrovertible facts 
as the baseline, and then we'll figure out on top of that, and we'll use our intuition, and we'll use our knowledge, and all that stuff, but what are the incontrovertible facts? It's all about seeking truth. In business, it's about seeking, seeking the truth. What's that incontrovertible fact? And leadership never ends. You can't turn it off. You can't say, I'm a leader in the office, and then be a jerk as a father. You, 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 can't, you can't do that, right? And I learned that when I was at UMB because I had this big community role too. And even if you're having a bad day, it doesn't matter to the person that you're talking to, right? So you've got to find a way to, to stay up. So for me, this is the best definition I've seen. It may or may not resonate with you and that's fine. I offer it for your consideration. Um, and I would say this, I've gotten a lot of feedback about the book. I get more feedback about this section than any other section in the book. Most of it very, very positive, and people saying, wow, that's, that's an interesting way to think, about, to think about leadership. I had a few people tell me to go to hell. But <laughs> beyond that, oh, I have, I have. And it's funny, I had a fight with my editor because when this, uh, I said, I want to use this in the book. And she said, no, no, we're not using this in the book. I said, you don't understand, Bonnie, we're, we're using this in the book. And she said, no, it doesn't fit. It's not, it's a, got a religious overtone. We're not using it in the book. And I, I think this is the only time I did this. I said, it's my book, not yours. I appreciate all the advice. I appreciate all the counsel. It's my book. And so we negotiated. In the end, it ended up as an afterward. Uh, so instead of in the, you know, the core part of the book, it's an afterward. So you'll, you'll see it at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the book. So I offer this for you to consider. Okay, so Cameron alluded to this idea that uh, I played a role in helping the Greater Kansas City Chamber set up their economic development strategy called the Big Five. And it was 2011, I think, 2010, 2011. And we were sitting around saying, you know what? The community was admiring Indianapolis and what they were doing and admiring St. Louis, God forbid, and what they were doing and <laughs> admiring, you know, Austin and what they were doing. And I'm like, we have to stop. Ha I was chairman of the, of the chamber at the time. We have to stop having these other city envy. Kansas City is a phenomenal place with a phenomenal history and a phenomenal legacy in many different respects. But one of its great legacies was, was a legacy of entrepreneurs. It's the place where uh, Ewing Kaufman created Marino Laboratories and left us the Kaufman Foundation, which is the foremost organization that supports entrepreneurs around the world, right? It's, it's a place with J.E. Dunn and Garmin and Sprint, and I can go on and on and on. There are 20, 50 great, great, great American companies that came, came out of small little companies in that community. But it was clear that the community didn't really have a cohesive uh, economic development strategy. So I don't know how it is in Fort Worth, but the business community sort of had to take over <laughs> and say, if you government types can't do this, we will set a roadmap for the community. We will set a strategic roadmap for the broader community. And by the way, Kansas City is complicated, probably just like um, Fort Worth is to some extent. There's a river that divides two states. You've got Kansas, you've got Missouri, you've got counties north of the river, counties south of the river. It's a very diff difficult place to administer, if you will, because there are so many different governmental entities. So herding those cats and try to get everybody to sign on with a common strategy, as Cameron knows well, was extraordinarily difficult. But we did it from the platform of the chamber, which was at least theoretically a regional resource that represented the entirety of the, of the region. And so we won't go through all these, but we basically said there are five things that we're going to be great at. We're going to get these things done, and we're going to move on to the next things after that. And one of them was this idea to make Kansas City America's most entrepreneurial city. Well, it was my idea, so guess what? I got to lead it, unfortunately. I say unfortunately because I had a day job that I had to do. And so it was a really bold, brash statement that Kansas City was, was already America's most entrepreneurial city. So I, one day I went, went to the Kauffman Foundation, visited with Carl Schramm, who was the CEO at the time, and then said, Carl, we want to declare that Kansas City is America's most entrepreneurial city, or at least we want to talk to you about doing that. And he said, um, yep, yep. And I said, I need your help. You've got all the money, you've got all the resources, you've got all the talent, I want to do this in our community. And he wasn't from Kansas City, he was from New York and, and all that, so he was committed to it, but not the way somebody who was local might, might have been. 
And I, he said, I'll help. I'll help. I'll give you people. Cameron was one of the people he gave us to help. Um, I'll give you resources. I'll give you money. But you have to do one thing for me. And I said, oh, shoot, what's that going to be? And he said, you have to stand up in front of the community and say and declare that Kansas City is America's most entrepreneurial city. And I said, I, I don't know, Carl. We, we, I can't prove that. In fact, the data would disprove that. That's not true. He said, that's not the point. You're trying to create an aspiration. You're trying to create an inspiration. And he said, you need to just declare it before somebody else does. And then we'll build it over time. We'll, we'll fill in the pieces and we'll build the ecosystem and we'll create this great entrepreneurial city. So I did it. There were two governors in attendance. There was probably three or 400 people in a big auditorium. And I said, we are Kansas City's, Kansas City is America's most entrepreneurial city. I didn't know what to expect. Well, people broke out in applause because for, for once we were creating a brand identity. We were setting a goal that we knew was going to be very difficult and long term in achieving it. But nonetheless, people got really excited. They got really proud that we were willing to throw the stake out there that far. And today, well, I think I've got some data. Well, I'll show you a few other things first. Entrepreneurship is still one of their, quote, big five. The other things have changed. But I'm really proud of the fact that we started this in 2011, and in 2023, they're still focused on it. Made progress along the way, don't get me wrong. I'm not sure we could still declare that we are America's most entrepreneurial city, but here are all the assets that we had. Well, not, this is not, not right. This is not all the assets. Here are a few of the assets that we had in the community to start to tell the story about how we could become America's most entrepreneurial city. Up on the far left, this one I think is the most, the most interesting one. So about the same time we were launching this, Google, Google Fiber came to Kansas City and said, we're going to wire Kansas City. The first city in America is going to have Google Fiber with ultra high fast speed internet. internet. And that was one of those moments where you're like, wow, fate really has intervened here because that's going to help this cause considerably. And this little icon on the left is for the Kansas City Startup Village. It's called KCSV. A bunch of old homes in Kansas City, Kansas started to be bought by entrepreneurs on one street in particular. And they, and they put Google Fiber in and they basically said, this is the Kansas City startup village. It was the coolest damn thing because it was all organic. It wasn't planned. It was people saying, okay, there's this new tech called Google Fiber and there are all these old derelict houses that we're gonna buy for $12,000 or whatever, or the city's gonna give us and we're gonna create a village. And they did. It was unbelievable. It was all organic. I'm not sure it would have happened without the chamber, and I'm not sure it would have happened without Google Fiber, but it was, it was so cool. Kansas City Source Link, what do you call yours here? Sparkyard. Sparkyard, you guys familiar with Sparkyard? Some of you anyways? Well, it started in Kansas City, you probably know. <laughs> Cameron brought it here. I hope they charge you a lot for it. Um, <laughs> there's a great woman by the name of Maria Myers, who this was her brainchild at UMKC and said, we need to build this ecosystem for entrepreneurs. And she and I worked together quite a, quite a while on it, but it was her idea for sure. And that is now almost the national standard and certain, country, uh, certain countries outside the United States use it as well. But that's right from Kansas City. Think big partners, the woman business setting, go on and on and on. And I could have found another hundred icons. We had the pieces, but the pieces weren't communicating with each other. The pieces weren't talking to each other. And I think we were the catalyst to cause that to happen. Now, again, as I say, is Kansas City today, uh, today, is it the most entrepreneurial city in the country? Probably not. But you start to look at lists like this and you're like 65. That, I mean, 65 is the score. You know, number 10, Miami, Orlando, New York, Boston, Houston, Dallas, Charlotte, Jacksonville, Raleigh, and Kansas City. That's pretty good. I don't have the same list from 25 years ago, but I can guarantee you it wouldn't have been 10. I can assure you of that. Uh, I don't see Fort Worth up there in the top 10. So. <laughs> That's a, that's a challenge. That's a, that's a challenge for all of you to, to get it up there. Um, and I could go through data after. The, what I can say is there's been tremendous improvement, tremendous improvement, both in the uh, empirical data and in the sense that you can start, build, grow, sell a business in Kansas City. So it was really a remarkable, remarkable thing. Um, I'm thrilled to know they're still doing it. They, they need to be, all right, 13, 12, 13 years later, they're still at it. They need to be, but I'm really proud of what they've done. And I no longer live there. <laughs> I live back in Boston. So 
Uh, but I'm, I keep an eye on, on what they're doing. So summary, um, my summary, you know, long-term success really does require patience and persistence. You can't have one without the other. You can be patient and not persistent, you don't go anywhere. You can be persistent and not patient, you're gonna spin in circles. So patience and persistence, I think, are, are two very variable things. Durable relationships I talked about, this idea in, in the First Corinthians passage that love and leadership are complementary with each other and not in conflict with each other, I think is a really important insight. Displaying vulnerability brings out our humanness, our genuineness, uh, and I think it's an, an important thing to do at appropriate times when you're ready to do it. Leading by principles we talked about, purpose we've talked about, having purpose, not just a vision, not just a mission, but purpose is very, very important. And we all have adversity. Anybody who says they don't is lying to you. We all have it, and we overcome it in our own way. So figure out what your adversity is, work to overcome it, and let others help you. If there's anything I learned about being a bit more vulnerable, it was the response I guess I expected was, it's your problem. Well, people made it their own problem, which was kind of, kind of cool. They're like, well, we'll help you, we'll help you raise money, we'll help you do whatever. And it, was, it, was a, it, was, it wasn't what I expected. It was much better than I expected, for sure. So I'm going to take questions if there are, whoops, if there are any. And also there, oh yeah, there's this thing called the Life and Leadership Principles Guide. If you want to get a copy of that, you're welcome to, welcome to have that. And in that, what I basically do is take the 10 principles and offer a set of readiness, what I call a readiness assessment on each of those. Are you ready to do this one? If not, here's what you need to, here's what you should be thinking about, about doing. So you can definitely do that. And uh, you can keep in touch with me at peterjdesilva.com. I'm on LinkedIn. I've got a business Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram. So feel free to keep in touch with me uh, any way you'd like. Uh, if you didn't get a book today, there's four or five left. If not, Amazon or Barnes & Noble or wherever, you can find the book pretty much, pretty much anywhere. So I'll stop there. And as I said, I'm more than happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions for Peter? You can get me privately later, too, if you want. <laughs> Peter, what would you say of your leadership lessons was the hardest one for you to learn or the one you maybe had to practice the most or was maybe the most natural? Let's put them back up because there's a couple of them I want to probably reference here. Um, for me, it was probably this idea of focus and finish because I like to do a lot of things simultaneously. And I was a little scattered when I was a younger executive. And it was like, oh, I gotta do this, and I gotta do that, I gotta do that. And I realized that, by the way, the reason the big five is only five is because we had to focus. There were hundreds of ideas. We did this whole community thing. We went out in the community and asked, what should we focus on? And there was literally like 100 some odd ideas. And we said, no, we can do five, and that's it. So this idea that focus brings greater achievement I think was something I had to learn because I felt like I needed to do all these things. Do the important things and do the important things well. You'll be much better off than doing a lot of things just okay. Just figure out what's most important and do it and do it well. I'd say that was the one I had to learn over time. And then I would say, oh, I never have a problem with urgency, that's for sure. I would say collaboration. You know, again, when you're a young leader, you're looking at everything through the lens of a bit of, you know, kind of me, 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 you know, and how do I get noticed and how do I get ahead? And maybe sometimes we even do that at the expense of others. What you come to appreciate as you get a bit older and a bit more mature about it is, no, this is really about, you know, the success of the group, the success of the team uh, more than it is about, about me. Um, but I had, I had to learn that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. Uh, anybody done a 360 review? I used to get that feedback from time to time, like, hey, you know what, you're, you're moving so fast, you're ahead of the rest of us, don't just bring us along, put us on the front end. You know, like, like most of your ideas are really good, right? but, but put us on the front end, you'll get a lot more what? You get a lot more commitment if you bring people along from the beginning. Um, so I had to learn that one as well. Peter, ultimately, how did the big five get selected? 
So we had a big community convention, so to speak, and as I said, there were probably 200 ideas at the time. Those got combined and winnowed down into maybe two dozen. Uh, there was a lot of similarities, so we had to, we had to winnow, them, winnow, them down, winnow them down a little bit. And then ultimately the board. The board sat down. Um, we had a subcommittee of the board, then the full board sat down and basically said, these are the five. And there were good reasons for each of them. Uh, yeah, there were some people who were upset that we didn't put their favorite idea in the mix, um, but I think the process was objective. It was community involved, a lot of community involvement, engagement in helping to define the process and the outcome. And because of that, we got a ton of commitment. When we came out and said, these are the five, um, people were very committed to help us in that, in that regard. So it took a little longer that way, <laughs> candidly. I went to too many community meetings, um, but, but it, we, we got more commitment that way. Yeah. So you pointed out that Fort Worth is not in the top 10. Sorry. We want to be in the top 10. What are the one or two things that you think are the most important things to focus on? Yeah. Yeah, you know, they talk about an ecosystem, right? And it's a big word and everything else, and there's all these different components to it. But I'd say more than anything, it's make it inviting for entrepreneurs to be here. Make it inviting. Everything, whether it's the city trying to change rules and regulations so it's easier to start a business here and the permitting process isn't crazy, or working with energy companies to make it inexpensive for young companies to start up, to having co-working space, whatever it is, you, you know the tactics better than I do for this community, but you have to make it inviting. You have to make it a place where they're like, you know what, but for Fort Worth, I wouldn't have been successful. Right. So what what does Fort Worth need to do to distinguish itself from other communities that are competing for the same talent, the same talent, same businesses, et cetera? How can you distinguish yourself and how do you build an environment that people want to be in? To me, that's the biggest that's the biggest darn thing. Yeah, you clearly accomplished a lot and reflected on, on your <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, I'm proud of my family. I've got two amazing daughters and my wife of 33 years. So I'm super proud of that, that we've been able to hold it together during all this. And I fully recognize that it's not one person's duty, right? It takes, it takes, a, it takes everybody working together. Super proud of that. But I think I said earlier, you know, there's the what and there's the how. I would hope people I've worked with would say, yeah, I got a few things done. But the way he did it, the way he engaged people, the ethical and, and high character way in which he works, the fact that he does give it, pay it forward and bring people along. And I do more mentoring and coaching than I probably should, most of it pro bono, but that doesn't mean I have time for anybody else right now. <laughs> uh, those sorts of things matter to me. So I'd rather people say, yeah, he, was, he did okay on the business side, but he was a really decent human being who really cared about others and tried to help them along. That would give me great satisfaction. Yeah. Um, oh, no, you can't go to the book. Oh, okay. Wait, you're going to read right from the book? So the section from Old Railroads to Wall Street, uh, yeah. I was checking out the dates and um, kind of started as an associate or an usher. Yeah. And, uh, during the remodeling, um, you were working as a, as a kind of like a site hand cleaning up. How long did that last before you kind of made that, like, you, that opportunity pop up? So the story is, um, when I was in college, I mentioned earlier, I had to work 50, 60 hours a week to put myself through college. I did it as an usher in a movie theater, a local, local movie theater. And um, one, at one point, they were going to renovate the place. So the place was going to be shut down for like six months or something like that. We we're adding screens and dividing the thing up and everything else. And so I'm like, oh, shoot, what am I going to do? I have to work to put myself through school. So I approached the contractor and I said, like, I know how to push a wheelbarrow, and I know how to hammer a nail, and I know how to do whatever. And this guy, Frank, he hired me. And he said, push the wheelbarrow. Go collect the concrete that we're you know, breaking apart and push the wheelbarrow and put it in the dumpster. That's what I did for a couple of months. And you know, it was one of those great life lessons for me that you have to be, one, industrious. You have to be creative. And life is not a straight path. I mean, there are all these detours. It's not a straight path. There are all kinds of detours that you're going to have. And the question isn't whether you come across those detours. It's how you handle those detours. So I didn't have a job. But I went to the guy and I said, can I have a job? You know, pushing a wheelbarrow. And he said, sure. And interestingly, um, 
the fellow who owned that company at the time and I are still great friends. And we laugh about that story all the time, all the time. So you gotta, you gotta be creative. Be creative. Uh, yeah. One more. Yes. One more. I don't know if you want to waste this on me, but we'd love to hear a story about Cameron. <laughs> Do I have an embarrassing Cameron story? I have a lot of Cameron stories. I just say this, that when, you know, after we visited with Carl, uh, Carl Schramm at the Kaufman Foundation, this is the guy that showed up on my doorstep. And that Carl had said, hey, go help this, this guy De Silva. He's trying to do something with entrepreneurs. And it has been a great friendship. It's been a great relationship. And Cameron has the kind of energy. He has the kind of intellect. He has the kind of capacity to really make a difference in Fort Worth. You're all obviously aware of that because you're here today. But tell, tell the world that this is going on in Fort Worth and that I think Fort Worth will be on the right list over the next decade or so. Don't expect it overnight. Don't expect it overnight. But over the next decade or two, you can do it, and Cameron's the guy to lead it. So that, thank you all. I appreciate it. Appreciate it very much.